Sarah Bedford is the Washington Examiner political and investigative reporter. Good morning, Sarah. Good Friday to you. Good morning. Thanks for having me. I had Mike Lawler on last hour. He tells me he's got enough Republicans to sign a discharge petition on air. The transcript and audio will be posted at HughHewitt.com. Uh, 33 months CR. What are you hearing, Sarah? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of frustration among the more moderate Republicans like Mike Lawler with the fact that you have these Freedom Caucus members who don't seem to have a clear end game. And, you know, a lot of personal animus towards McCarthy seems to be driving some of this. But I do think that, you know, there, there's certainly been progress this week towards towards bringing this to an end. But I mean, still, it, it makes McCarthy uh, look weak in some ways to have these Freedom Caucus people sort of undermining spending levels that were negotiated before, threatening a shutdown. And there's nothing that clear that he's really been able to offer them because they don't seem to have a, a, a super coherent set of demands. Well, that's what Mike Lawler said. They don't have any demands. They just, they hate McCarthy. Lawler went out of his way, by the way, to praise Speaker McCarthy for having the patience of Job. But when you've got only four votes because of the resignation of Chip Stewart in Utah due to the family emergency, you've got to have everybody but Gates, Rosendale, and and uh, Dan Bishop. They're running for higher office. They're, they're looking for clicks and donations. What do you expect to happen? Because I do believe we'll end up with a three-month CR that doesn't do anything for Republicans. And by the way, do you think former President Trump is going to call up Matt Gates and say, Matt, I'm going to win re-election. I don't want a House that's run by Democrats. They'll impeach me again. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, what I, what I, what I sort of see happening is, you know, McCarthy can pass things with Democratic votes. That's obviously something that, that he can do when his margin is so thin, something he might very well end up needing to do. And conservatives have sort of said that's going to poison the well if that's the way that you want to move, a, you know, whether it's an omnibus, whether it's a CR, if, if you want to move that forward without even trying to quarter votes. But ultimately, that seems to be the path that McCarthy's going to have to walk because, you know, if these conservatives aren't really giving him any room, something has to get passed eventually. Right. And so, you know, they're sort of forcing McCarthy into the hands of Democrats in some ways by not even really giving him an opening any way, any path forward to win their votes. The problem, Sarah, is that Gates and Rosendale and Bishop are for sale, but they won't stay bought. They have, according to law, they have moved the goalposts repeatedly and thus the caucus, except for these 12, and it's sometimes down to five, and it's usually just those three are talking at the microphone, is very frustrating. And McCarthy's doing a wonderful job, but you really can't negotiate with someone who doesn't have any demands. Right. Well, I mean, sometimes you hear them saying, you know, we want more border security policies, immigration reform. Sometimes you hear them saying, you know, the spending levels that were negotiated a few months ago, those aren't sufficient. We need to, to revisit those. So, you know, if it was one specific thing, right? If they were asking for, let's just say, a chunk of money to build the border wall and, you know, McCarthy could either decide to grant that or not, that would be one thing. For McCarthy, this seems about about just as much as any sort of spending cuts. Uh, this also seems about weakening him as a speaker and these conservatives flexing their muscles within the conference. And so, you know, it, it, in that context, the the undermining McCarthy is kind of the goal and they're accomplishing it. Well, well, let me ask you that. I didn't know this until Ben Dominich told me Matt Gates is going to run for governor of Florida. Brian Donald's is going to wipe the floor with him over this thing. Matt Rosendale's running for Senate in Montana. He's not going to beat the, the seal who's up there. Dan Bishop wants to be attorney general of North Carolina. I, I think he's blowing up his chances there. Have you done any work on whether those three are raising money for those campaigns yet? Because this is counterproductive for each of them. I haven't, but it's certainly, if that is their goal, they're accomplishing it, right? They're they're in the headlines. They're being perceived as sort of leading a so far successful charge to uh, obstruct and upend the uh, appropriations process. So if, if that is their goal, I think they're certainly accomplishing it. And, you know, by the way, those a lot of those Republicans are also in 
you know, really safe red districts like Matt Gates is never at risk of losing reelection, right? The way Mike Lawler very well could be next year. So a lot of these Republicans have different calculations when they're going into these negotiations. But I'm but, but sure Gates, that it's frustrating. Gates can't be beaten in his district. Gates cannot be beaten in Florida. But if he runs for governor, he's against Brian Donalds, who's working with McCarthy. I do believe that the, the caucus split reflects the split in the Republican Party. Uh, and that would be about 97 percent behind Speaker McCarthy and 3 percent behind Gates, Rosendale and Bishop. I really do believe the caucus actually represents the party, not these three outliers. 